Scandinavia, a region in Northern Europe comprising Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, is known for its high quality of life with excellent healthcare and education systems, long life expectancies, and chart-hopping happiness index levels due to its strong focus on work-life balance and societal well-being. Additionally, Scandinavia also fosters some of the greatest and most unique natural beauties in the world, including fjords, mountains, forests, and the northern lights. However, during research about Scandinavia, I came across an article that piqued my interest. Naturally, I didn't want to read all of it, so I resorted to YouTube, inputting the keywords Scandinavia isostatic rebound. But nothing came up, only isolated videos about past ice ages and glacial movement. So that meant I had to read, to understand what really is isostatic uplift. Throughout Earth's history, we have experienced many warmer and cooler periods. This is regular throughout time, and is largely dependent on Earth's varying physical distance from the Sun, and solar output variations. Unlike most planets, Earth experiences these changes to a great extent. However, this is not the only thing that alters Earth's climate. Plate tectonics and continental drift also play a minor role in natural, long-term climate change. Atmospheric heat distribution and wind patterns are altered by constant mountain building, like the Himalayas, that formed 50 million years ago and are still growing due to the uplift caused by the collision of the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates. Oceanic heat distribution is also affected by tectonics, such as the closure of the Panama Canal 15 million years ago, indirectly disrupting the flow of warm and cold water from the Pacific to the Atlantic Oceans. Earth experiences these changes greatly due to a relatively thick atmosphere, which is comprised of nitrogen, oxygen, and other greenhouse gases, mainly including carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, which trap and reflect solar radiation back to the Earth, warming the climate. For example, oceans are Earth's largest natural reservoir of carbon dioxide, absorbing about 30 to 40% of the CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide dissolves more easily in the cold water than in warm water. As global temperatures rise, the surface of the oceans warm, reducing the storage of CO2 and releasing it back into the atmosphere to increase the greenhouse effect and act as a positive feedback loop. The exact same process happens with carbon release from permafrost thaw, overall causing glacial and interglacial periods. Currently, we are in a naturally warmer interglacial period, where Earth is largely glacier-free. The last glacial period occurred from 115,000 to 11,700 years ago during the Pleistocene epoch. During this, sea levels were roughly 120 meters lower than they are today due to mass water storage in ice sheets, including the Laurentide Ice Sheet in North America, the Patagonian Ice Sheet in South America, and the Fennoscandian Ice Sheet over Scandinavia. The Fennoscandian Ice Sheet was massive, reaching a thickness of over 2 to 3 kilometers in some regions. Its immense mass exerted a downward force on the Earth's crust. This created a weight irregularity, where the area of Fennoscandinavia was heavier than the region surrounding it due to the weight of the ice. However, this was not supposed to be possible, as the weight at every point on Earth's surface needs to be equal at a depth of compensation between the crust and mantle boundaries. At the time, there were two theories of how this sinking was possible. Firstly, was Pratt's solution to isolation. The extra mass of the ice on the surface is compensated for by less mass below the surface, so that the total mass in any column is the same. Meaning, where there was no ice, the crustal density was greater, and where there was ice, the crustal density was less, therefore resulting in equal weight. However, Airy had a different theory. His model was analogous to icebergs floating on water. To compensate for the weight of the Fennoscandian ice sheet, he believed that the mantle, which has a greater density than the crust, and therefore a greater weight, would flow higher than the compensation depth in order to even out the weight. These theories were debated for many years, but ultimately both had fundamental flaws, and it wasn't until 1929 that the venning minus theory was proposed. This showed that we were viewing ice sheet weight irregularities from the wrong perspective. Instead of a smaller, local compensation, we should be viewing from a larger, regional scale. It highlighted a combination of the two previous theories, and the addition of lithospheric flexure of the crust and mantle, creating a curved crust mantle boundary. The Fennoscandian ice sheet was largely present during the last ice age, 11,000 to 2.5 million years ago. This resulted in a large depression, somewhere between 300 and 800 meters below its current altitude. As the Earth's climate warmed out of this ice age to current temperatures, the Fennoscandian glacier melted, 
resulting in an immense worldwide sea level rise and the ground of Scandinavia to be revealed. However, there was another problem. With this melting, the weight of Scandinavia sitting above the Earth's mantle was significantly decreased, which meant Earth's crust had to adapt to these new conditions. It naturally did this through a concept called isostatic rebound, as illustrated earlier in the Venning Minus model. As soon as the ice melted, Scandinavia was rising at a rate of 5 to 10 millimeters per year depending on location. This rebound has already raised Scandinavia roughly 500 meters since the last ice age, and geophysical models predict it to grow as much as 600 meters in the next few thousand years. There is already evidence of raised beaches from this uplift. In Sweden and Finland, former beaches and marine sediments have been found as high as 200 to 300 meters above sea level due to uplift. The Kvarken archipelago in Finland are gaining one square kilometer of new land per year as land rises from the sea. Additionally, this uplift has the potential to greatly increase the height of the Scandinavian mountain range, rivaling a more similar size of the Alps. This would significantly increase Norwegian rainfall, especially on the west coast. Areas like Bergen and Trondheim, already among the wettest places in Europe, would get even more rainfall and snowfall. However, there is a much worse impact of isostatic rebound. But it is not in Scandinavia. The Netherlands, a country already struggling with being one of the flattest in the world, with a large portion of the land being below the currently rising sea level, is sinking as a result of isostatic rebound. You see, as Scandinavia rises, there is a knock-on effect on the Netherlands as the lithospheric flexure reverses, pushing the Netherlands, Denmark, Northern Germany and Southern England downwards. 